Anyway, so I'm going to talk about pumping simulations for many body uh, problems. And uh, so this will be like a talk, very general talk about algorithms for quantum simulations. And at the end of the talk, I will go to um, some specific physical system for lack of optical lattices. And so I will tell you a little bit about some ideas that we have been developing in how to use these systems for quantum simulation, all the way from condensed matter physics problems to high energy physics problems and based on the quantum chemistry problems. Okay, so I think that you don't need an introduction or motivation for why quantum computers or quantum, quantum simulators are, are, are interesting from the point of view of quantum many body systems. We have many quantum many body systems that appear very naturally in, in, in physics, in chemistry. And uh, as I was mentioning yesterday in my, in my talk, so whenever we want to describe the systems, they do calculations, make predictions about the systems in an exact way. Then we typically have to discretize space, we put them on a lattice, and then we put the qubits in each of the lattices. So at the end, what we have to solve in all these problems is a, is a, is a kind of uh, set of qubits that are interacting with each other. Now, depending on the system that you have, then the interaction will take different ways. So sometimes they are vocal, sometimes they are not vocal as well. So this is described as a some Hamiltonian. And at the end, uh, I mean, you're in some initial condition or you want to talk about some properties of the system, so you have to write uh, these uh, states. And so you want to compute it in a classical computer, you will have to write, uh, you have to find the complex coefficients in some particular basis, in the computational basis, for example. And since there are two to the n, where n is the number of qubits of your system, then this means that you will have both an exponential uh, uh, dependence on the memory that you have to use in a classical computer as well as an exponential time because each of the coefficients in order to compute them since they are two to the power n then for each of them you have to do at least one calculation so the number of computations will also be exponential in time so that's something that i insisted yesterday that it's different from when you want to use quantum computers to solve classical problems because the memory uh, problem this exponential dependence is not there but for quantum many body systems Right away, you are confronted with the fact that you need an exponential exponential memory. In fact, so you could trade now uh, time by memory. And so, for example, you could say, so what happens if I have a memory in my quantum computer that is constant or only allow allow it to grow linearly with the system size? Maybe it cannot be larger than the number of atoms that I have in the universe, the number of variants that I have in the universe. So that's constant. So can I still run? computations there, yes, but then you will have, it will take more time. And so people have figured out that then actually the computational time then grows in a, even faster than exponentially. So it's, a, it's two to the n to the power the function that depends on the depth of the circuit that you want to simulate this, this uh, classical computer. So what I'm saying here is something that you know very well that this uh, quantum many body problems are especially suited for quantum computers or quantum simulators. And that's something that yeah, was not discovered now, but discovered many years by, by, among other people, Richard Feynman, who would just say that if you have a quantum computer, so you want to describe a set of qubits, if you do it using a set of qubits, then you right away in memory, because the memory will only be proportional that you will need. The number of qubits that you need to simulate a number of qubits is exactly the same, so it goes linearly with the number of qubits that you want to simulate. And now the question is the time. And so now depending on the problem that you want to solve, with your quantum yeah. computer, right? then depending on the quantum many body question that you want to address, then the computational time may be very efficient, maybe linear in n or exponential in n, or it depends on the knowledge that we have on, on, on the different algorithms and the different problems. And so that's uh, now in, if you try to solve these problems with uh, uh, quantum computing, then now you look at the algorithms that solve this set of problems, and there are different algorithms. Some of them, I mean, are uh, applied to, to uh, quantum computers that are, don't have errors. These are kind of tolerant quantum computers. And some other algorithms applied or could work also for uh, quantum computers that have errors, NISP devices. And among the NISP devices, and we can distinguish between the digital NISP devices and analog uh, this uh, uh, these devices, so the digital these devices will be gate based. So you have a Hamiltonian, you want to solve the problem, then you translate it into some quantum circuit, you apply the gates, and then you measure and it, that you answer the question that you pose. And the analog one is that instead of using gates, then you take a system that you can take very well, 
then you engineer the interaction in the system that corresponds to the Hamiltonian that you want to solve. Just let it evolve, just wait, measure at the end, maybe repeat it several times, and then you will answer this question. And uh, yeah, so these are two alternatives that one we have now experiment. So we're experimentally working on analog uh, digital quantum simulators and some other ones, or digital quantum simulators and smaller ones working on analog. So what I want to do today is to, uh, on the one hand, talk about quantum algorithms that exist to solve quantum many-body problems. Uh, yes, distinguish a little bit among the ones that work with analogs or digital and or the deep fault tolerant quantum computation and tell you a little bit the scaling of each of them as, as far as, as we know. And we have been interested and developed some of these algorithms, so I particularly concentrate on the ones that we have been more interested in. And then later on, uh, the last part of my talk, I will talk about analog quantum simulation with collatums and optical lattices. And I will tell you so what kind of problems you can simulate, or what we think that you could simulate with cold atoms, so in ranging, as I mentioned, from condensed matter physics to high energy physics to quantum chemistry. And so, what I will assume for the rest of the talk is that we have a problem that is described in terms of a lattice, and it can be one dimensional, two dimensional, three dimensional, or maybe five dimension. We have a Hamiltonian that's given that describes the interactions that we want to solve. And this Hamiltonian, I will assume also that this. Geometrically local, so it's a sum of terms of this described there, in which each of the terms is acting on a set of qubits that are localized somewhere, like it's drawn there in the, uh, in the example. So, this locality in many of the algorithms that we mentioned can be relaxed. In, you know, they also work for, for uh, non local, however, in order to start distinguishing local and non local, then assume right away that everything is local, so that everything that I say in, uh, will, will work. Okay, so let me start now with something that probably you know very well, and uh, talking about the dynamics. So, in principle, in quantum simulation, you can talk, uh, try to solve problems that are related to dynamics. Uh, so, you want to know if you start with some initial state, and then you return or you do something. You would like to know what are the physical properties after a certain time. This is what we call dynamical problems. The other ones are more equilibrium. So you have a thermal equilibrium, and then you would, would like to know what are the properties, the physical properties of system in thermal equilibrium. So I'm starting uh, with the dynamics. And so the typical problem is that you're giving a Hamiltonian, you're giving a lattice, the geometry, whatever it is, and uh, then you're giving some initial state, and these are typically some state that is easy to prepare or easy to describe. For example, it could be just a product state in your lattice, so all the all your qubits are in zero or something like that. <coughs> And you're given some prescribed time, so you would like to know what will happen after some time t, and then you're giving some observable operator that I will assume here also that is some local observable, and the goal is to compute the expectation value of this observable after the evolution time t. And uh, this in a classical computer is, is very difficult in general, it's an exponential time in the number of qubits. Uh, Goes exponentially with some of the part and so on, but with the quantum computer, we know already for a very long time that this can be done very efficiently. So, the first person that addressed this problem, let's say, more systematically and, and show scaling and so on, was Lloyd in 1996. And what he says is that in a quantum computer, it should be it could be done very easily. Just start your initial state, prepare this product state in your quantum computer. Now, uh, uh, Evolve the state according to this Hamiltonian, and then at the end measure this observable, repeat it many times, compute the expectation of the, the, the average value, and this will give a good uh, uh, number for the, the problem that you want to compute. So the only question is how to perform this evolution, and so how to give some initial state in a quantum computer, how you can. Have an algorithm that describes evolution. You have an analog quantum computer that's simple, just let the system evolve and measure at the end. But you have a discrete, then what he uh, proposed is just to trotterize the time evolution operator to divide in small time steps, and each of the time steps, then you can approximate it with a quantum circuit, quantum circuit. and that's the, the one method. And then he showed already in that paper that the computational time in a quantum computer, in a digital quantum computer, Will scale like the number you have this uh, neural network interactions will scale like the number of queries that you have squared, the compute the, the time that you have been prescribed squared, and if you have a prescribed error, you would like to find this expectation value of this observable with an error of epsilon, this case by one or epsilon. 
So it was in 1996. In the meantime, there have been many algorithms. And so I think that the, 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 the best one now is the one by our case name for Barry and Low. And this case is much better. So it scales linearly with the number of keys, linearly with time, and you are to what with one or epsilon. Um, however, uh, well, that's, uh, uh, and so, so that's a very clear case in which if you compare to the same problem, you want to try to solve the, the same problem with a classical computer, then there is a big advantage with a, with a quantum computer. And the big advantage is because both memory, you only need n qubits, and time, because here it will be linear or quadratic orders. In the other one, you need an exponential number of, let's say, of bits and an exponential number of time. So that's a very clear, and I think that everybody is aware of this fact. So, what about now equilibrium problems, uh, zero temperature? So, now the problem is formulated this similarly. So, you're giving a Hamiltonian, and we know that the Hamiltonian will have certain spectrums of energy eigenstates. And there's the one which is the lowest one, this is what we call the ground state. And what uh, the, the goal is to compute properties of that ground state. And so you're giving again some observable, and then you would like to compute what is the expectation value of this observable in the ground state. And now with a quantum computer with full generality, so you don't hold conditions in the in the Hamiltonian, that's uh, difficult. That's very difficult. So exactly it's exponential. So we would take an exponential time. In a quantum computer, we know that that's problem in formulation as a decision problem, so it's really hard. And so now, what you can aim at, you don't put some restrictions on the Hamiltonian, but you have a very general Hamiltonian, is maybe to find what is the best uh, 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 coefficient that is uh, in front of this M. And so people have been now finding some algorithms that under Let's say uh, that would be different values of this alpha. So it would be two to the power alpha times n. So you would like this alpha to be very small. So imagine that you're able to show that alpha is equal to 0 0.0001. Then it's great. But imagine that I mean the best alpha is 100, then it is very bad because you will not be able to do anything. So you would like to get an algorithm where this alpha is very, very small. And so now there are many, many results on that. But one example is the one that I'm quoting here. So you assume that there is a gap here between the ground state and the, uh, and the and the excited state, and you call it delta, so it doesn't depend on it to be any any gap. Then, for example, there is a quantum algorithm that achieves two to the power n house divided by delta logarithm of one over epsilon. And I'm saying that we don't expect that it would be possible to get something that is not exponential, but maybe it's possible to get a better a better power. But I think that that's the, the best that we, that we have. Today. Now, this algorithm that it's, that it's uh, proposed here, this doesn't work for these devices, nor analog, so it requires a full tolerance quantum computer. It's a sophisticated, I will not explain it here. But anyway, so I want to go more to what are called heuristic algorithms. So these are some algorithms that probably will work in practice and uh, that uh, will not scale exponentially. And the reason why this can be like that is because now we can put conditions on the physical on the, on the problem that we want to solve. So I mean the physics problem that we want to solve are Hubbard models, maybe lattice gauge theories, I mean spinning models, and so on. And these are very very special. They're not like a general problems, they're very special. And so you can start looking at these problems, looking at the properties that they have, and then uh, make sure that uh, that an algorithm will apply will give better results. And this actually what happens with what is called a um, adiabatic algorithm, that's one of the possible algorithms that is based on something that we know very well in physics, you know, the adiabatic theorem. And the idea is to, you want to solve some Hamiltonian that is your problem. Uh, however, uh, you know that uh, for other Hamiltonians, you know what is the ground state. So for example, for a Hamiltonian in which your qubits don't interact with each other, the ground state maybe just takes zero, 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 the product state. Then you can interpolate between these two Hamiltonians and you, would have an interpolation. We prefer the initial state of uh, as a ground state of the Hamiltonian that you know, and then you change the parameters sufficiently low, and under some conditions, then you will be able to prepare the ground state of the problem Hamiltonian. That's what is called the adiabatic algorithm, and then it relies on the, the property that the, the gap between the, uh, the energy gap between the uh, ground state and the first excited state should not close. And if it doesn't close, then you know that if you do 
this change vision is low, then you will end up in the ground state. So the problem would be that you start with the ground state of the known Hamiltonian, and then you do the dynamics corresponding to the uh, algorithm that I mentioned before, from Sepoy to from Solvarios, who this dynamic describes the change of this Hamiltonian as a function of time. And if you do it, then you will end up with the ground state of the problem Hamiltonian. Then you measure your observable. Then you start again, you do it again, measure the observable, do it many times, at the end, compute the average of this observable, and that's the result that you uh, that you give. And it's known already for many years that the computational time for this problem depends on the number of qubits that you have, but also on the smallest gap along the way. And so it scales, there are many results, but typically it scales like this uh, gap to the power of minus one, minus three. And so it means that now you have a problem in which this gap, the I mean, make close, but close like one divided by n or one divided by n squared, one divided by polynomial, <coughs> then the computational time will be still polynomial. We draw only polynomial with the system size. And it turns out that in physics problems, most of the physics problems that are interesting, this gap, it's the case like one divided by poly n. So you have a critical system, then it will decrease like one divided by n to some critical exponent. And so, therefore, for the physics problems that we are interested in, for many of them, that's the case. So this means that in practice, for many of these problems, then a quantum computer will give you an algorithm that is efficient and that um, that will be able to solve problems that with classical computers we don't know how to solve. In classical computers, still to solve this problem takes an exponential time. Now, of course, now in practice, uh, uh, with these scalings with n and delta and something like that, it's like n to the power four. That's very unpractical for these devices. And therefore, then maybe we will have to wait until the errors are much smaller than the one that we have now in order to really go to a regime where you can investigate some of the interesting problems that, that appear in this. Well, uh, uh, there is another algorithm, which is a variational quantum algorithm, and which well, I will not explain it here. But uh, so uh, and at some point, with we thought is that it would be good to combine the variational and the adiabatic algorithm. And so we publish a paper about that, which is very simple. So the idea is that when you have to do this adiabatic algorithm, then you have to change the parameters as a function of time. And it may happen that it's better, I mean, you like to do it as, 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 as fast as possible, right? Because then I mean, you have less errors and so on. So maybe it can, you can have that the parameters that you don't have to change it just uh, as, a, as a constant speed, but you can go change it fast at the beginning, then slow, then fast, and then slow, and so on. And with that, you can gain with respect to the computational time. And indeed, so what you can do is the speed, you can use it as a variational parameter. And now there's a procedure just by learning somehow how you do that, that you can uh, improve the speed for, for your uh, adiabatic algorithm just with these variational parameters. And, now, so we publish uh, and, and, and propose some ways of doing that. And so what we see is that if we, for example, take, take 50 qubits and we want to simulate a, a model, like a typical model, uh, the Hamiltonian you have it there, uh, then we can gain factors of 10 in time with respect to the adiabatic algorithm just by doing it in the way. And if you look at the experiments of uh, Howard from Misha Lukin and, and this group in which he has prepared some, I mean, some solve some problems and the so on, they are doing something similar to that. So they're really not having a constant time, which was not, not a constant rate that you change your parameters in your Hamiltonian, but you learn that you go faster, go faster and lower, you do some measurements in between, and then in this way you can improve and, and, and go beyond the distance. Another thing that I want to mention is that um, so there are some problems in physics in which the gap is constant. So maybe you're in a phase and then you have some uh, initial state because you have some state in a phase of a Hamiltonian, and then you would like to know some properties, physical properties of the change in the same phase. And then in that case, the gap will not change. You move in the phase, you move the parameters in the phase. And in that case, so you take the adiabatic algorithm, as I mentioned before, still, even if the gap is constant, then the computational time will be proportional to the system size. And so what we showed in, in the paper is that, in fact, you can do it better than that. So you have 
Uh, and, and probably in that case, you want to be published, you have a, what is called a frustration free problem in, in any dimension. Then it turns out that you can do it in a time that doesn't grow linearly with n, but grows like a logarithm of n. And uh, so we believe that this can be generalized onto non frustrated systems. And so that in general, for gap system, then it can be extremely faster algorithm because it, 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 it's case like log n or only log n instead of n. Okay, so the the so from here about the conclusion is that if you want to solve dynamics in the system, then quantum simulator seems to be very useful. If you want to solve ground state problems, even though people may tell you, well, these are very difficult, they're PMA hard and so on. In practice, for the physics problems that you're interested in, for many of them, it will be very useful because they have the property of the gap and the adiabatic algorithm will tell you that can be more efficient than the than a quantum computer, or if there is no gap, then you can be extremely fast because the scale like for it. Yeah. Won't you usually the stage you can prepare is not in the same phase as the stage you're trying to target, right? Right, no, but this is for the case in which you would like to do that. Okay. Just for that particular case, then you can show that it's okay. Otherwise, it will depend on the gap, and then there are different different here with the delta to the minus third, <coughs> some papers which have a delta to the minus square, and other that show that this is optimal, and so there's a lot of information. But that's for a specific case. If you don't want to cross the phase transitions. But again, if you want to cross the phase transition, what I'm saying it will be polynomial in it. There will not be nothing exponential as long as the gap goes like one over four minutes. Okay, so now I'm moving to finite temperature. So now I'm still in thermal equilibrium, but now it's not at zero temperature, but at finite temperature. And then you can uh, formulate many kinds of problems, but let me just mention two of them. So one of them would be, uh, it's called a kind of a micro canonical ensemble, and the other one is a canonical ensemble. So the first one, so this is the spectrum of your Newtonian. So before I was asking about physical properties of the ground state, the state that has the lowest energy. Now I can ask questions about some states which are somewhere in the middle of the spectrum or somewhere in the spectrum at some other energy, that's one particular case. But here, I mean, the, the, even the questions are a bit subtle. Because if I tell you what are the properties of the energy uh, of states at this particular energy, since this has a discrete spectrum, it's impossible that I will hit exactly one of the states. So I'll have to say within some width. So I will have to, in my problem, formulate it in terms of I would like to know what are the properties of states which have this energy plus minus delta, for example. Now, the other way is to ask properties about the canonical ensemble. And so canonical ensemble is a density operator, which is given by the Gibbs density operator as a function of your Hamiltonian. So basically what you would like to know is that uh, you would like to have some average properties of the whole spectrum, but weighted with some exponential of the ensemble. And these two are two different problems. And so the first thing is so how difficult are they are in general? So you don't put any conditions on your Hamiltonian and they're very difficult. Because they include in particular the ground state. So, I mean, I can specify any energy, they tell you this energy here, and then I went back to the ground state problem and told you that the ground state problem in general is very really hard, so it takes an exponential time to for a quantum computer. And, but, however, and we also know that for these problems, even in general, so you, if I give you a very high temperature, so I said the infinite temperature, then the problem is completely trivial because then the state is completely random. So, what probably would happen? Is that there should be some phase transition in the difficulty. So, I mean, at high temperature, you can do it in, in polynomial time. You can solve these problems in polynomial time and you decrease. And at some point, at some certain temperature, at certain energy, then become difficult and it's, the ground state is difficult. And this will happen both for classical quantum computation and for quantum computation. And so, what may happen is that this transition occurs at different points. And so, that for quantum computers, then you can go beyond the temperatures. That's with classical computers, even for general problems. So this may be that even in general, there might be advantages with a quantum computer because then you can go to lower energies than with a classical computer. So that's, that's not, uh, I don't think that this is exactly known. Now, so one, one way of you know, qualitatively understanding why this is difficult is to look at the density of state. So these Hamiltonians, by the fact that they are local, then the distribution of eigenstate is very peculiar. So most of the eigenstates are in the center of the spectrum. They're exponentially many altogether, and most of them are in the center of the spectrum and very, very few on the, on the side. And if you now look at intensity quantum, instead of drawing here the energy in your spectrum, you do the energy divided by n. 
and you count how many states are in some interval, that's what is called the density of states, and you see that if you increase the number of qubits, then it's going to be very, very, very narrow. It's getting very narrow, like Gaussian that goes to a delta function. And so you're asking about certain energies. So I tell you, well, I would like to know this energy per particle. I would like to know properties. Then if I'm increasing the number of particles, then I'm in a Gaussian all the way to the end. So the number of states that have these properties are very few. And that's why it's very hard to get to those states that have these this properties. So it's like you have a, I don't call it a, a nozzle that, that uh, you know, you want to go to some state and, and, and you start trying to move in this spectrum, then you start moving in the middle and it's very unlikely to go to one of these states because there are very few of them where you're interested in. But anyway, so let me just now formulate some things that we know, some algorithms that we know for that. So let me go first to the finite energy or microcanonical ensemble. So, I mean, roughly speaking, what you want to fix is now, this, you want to know what is the scaling, so you'd like to know so what is the computational time in a classical computer as compared to a quantum computer? If I make the system bigger and bigger and bigger, then you have to formulate in a way that is fair the comparison, that you can make a fair comparison. And the way that you can do it is that you fix the energy density, so the energy per particle. And then you say, well, for an energy, total energy, which is the, 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 the number of particles and the energy density, then you take an interval of delta, and let me ask properties about states that have energy in this energy interval delta. So more formally, you can fix this energy density if you're given that. Then you have before in the other problem, they're giving some observable magnetization, something like that. And then you would like to know with certain precision, silent, what is the expectation value of this observable in a state that fulfills that has a mean value of the energy which corresponds to this one here. And it has a variance that is smaller than this delta. And that's a, a well formulated problem. And now the question is that in order to solve this problem, how, how much time does it take with a classical with a quantum computer? And now for this problem at the moment, uh, it's, uh, it's very arbitrary because how much should be delta? Should be delta constant? Should be one over n? Should be exponential n? And so people have figured out that for physics problems, so typically when things get interesting is when this delta is of the order of one over n. So the delta is very narrow. Because in that case, you approach the monodynamic properties. Okay, so now you could, I mean, ask for this, 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 this problem. And uh, now we can take the, the, the physics approach is that, I mean, let me try to solve this problem with the best algorithm that we know. Because we know, for example, in one dimensional system with matrix product states or exact calculation of tensor network, and let's see what would be the computational time to solve this problem, as I posited before. And you take, for example, in one dimension with matrix product states, and then the computational time escapes like the minimum of the exponential of one over delta and the exponential of n. And as I mentioned before, the interesting regime, it was delta with one over n, which means that the computational time uh, grows exponentially with n. With, this, with these algorithms. And uh, so then the quantum algorithm would be good if it's not exponential. And so in fact, in, in, in fact you know, there is a quantum algorithm that solves the same problem that is not exponential. So let me, let me just uh, explain more or less how it works. And so well, the, the idea is that, first of all, you have to be able to prepare a state that has the energy that you have been asked to prepare. So you have to rely on something like the adiabatic algorithm, or maybe there's a product state that has this energy. That's a requisite that you have to fulfill in order to use this algorithm. So first, you prepare a state, which is at the target energy. And if you cannot do that, then you cannot use the algorithm. Right? So this is a prerequisite. And once you have it, the problem of this state is that it will probably be very broad. So in fact, you have a product state, you prepare a state that has this energy and has a product state, and you can easily show that the width, the variance of the energy that it will have will be square root of n, it will be very hard. And so now the second part of the algorithm makes it thinner. And so would make some, put some spectral filter, and this would be what the quantum computation will do. The quantum computation will transform the state into something which keeps the energy, but makes it narrower and narrower, so it re reduces the variance. And in principle, then if you would have that state that now has is it with this energy and with this variance, then the only thing that you have to do is measure the observable there, repeat it many times, 
and then compute the, the, the average value of the observable, and with that, you answer the problem. However, the algorithm does something that is more clever than that. It does not prepare the state. And so what it does are some computations, compute some other numbers, and with these numbers that without preparing the state, this is what is called time series, with these numbers, then you can answer the question without preparing the state. So let, let me explain the, maybe a little bit more in detail. Well, so the first one is that the preparation is relatively simple. The second one is that you put a, you want to filter it. And so you can do like in optics, in optics, so you, you have a light that has very broad, you can make a Gaussian filter, make a filter that way that some of the light only goes through. So this does something to you, so that that is takes your product set and puts a Gaussian filter and applies a, some, some operator, which what, what makes it narrower. And the problem is that this operator is not unitary. So this cannot be uh, performed with a, with a quantum computation. And but what you can do is you have to take the Gaussian filter and basically Fourier transform. And if Fourier transform, then you see that this Gaussian filter will be a sum of, you cannot see it from, from the energy. But anyways, you can see that this Gaussian filter is a sum of evolution operators. Okay, so basically, in order to make this filter, what you have to do is to evolve for a time t, evolve for a time 2t, evolve for a time 3t, 4t, 5t, or minus t, minus 2t, and make a superposition of all of that. And the superposition of all of that, we are able to do that, and the superposition of this evolution operator, then it will correspond to having applied this filter. And now the next uh, the step. Is not the prepared state which is a superposition, this kind of strong and can be a superposition. But you say, well, at the end, what I want to do is to take my state that would be a superposition and measure some expectation value. And so measuring an, uh, an expectation value would be like to take each of the evolution from here, each of the evolution, I mean the bracket in the cap, and then compute some expectation value. So what you can do is to compute just each of the terms independently, you want to compute something like that, then you can compute. Like the evolving after some time t1, observable evolving after some time minus t1, expectation values. And then for different t's and t primes, you do that, compute these numbers many, many times. And with these numbers, then you can compute these expectation values just by summing, dividing, and so on. So that's the whole idea. The whole idea again is just that you have to do at the end is to start with your initial state that this is to prepare, evolve it for a time, then. I mean, you would have to put there some observable. If it's a unitary observable, you can always write it as a sum of unitaries. Then you put some gate there, and then you evolve it for some other time, and then you look at the overlap with the initial state. And if you do it many, many times, and for many times, then at the end, you will be able to get this observable. Now, let's let this explain there. So what you have to do is to measure this part. This is, this is like a loss detection. So it's a little work in which you start with some depth. So this uh, first state that you have to prepare, does it have to be mostly an eigenstate? Like, presumably it can't be like this average energy, but made of two eigenstates that are far apart. It can be, can be anything. Okay. So, okay, so, I mean, this, so, yeah, I mean, the, one, one way of doing is if you have a product state that has this energy, then you're basically done, you can the product state, but probably there are no product states at the energy you're interested in. So what you could do, is if you can prepare the ground state, just prepare adiabatically the ground state, and then just flip spins until the energy is the one that you want. And then if you do that, then you have a variance between this product of n, and then you'll apply this algorithm. That's one particular way. Anyway, so these are the, the quantities that you have to measure. This is what I mentioned before. You start with P, this is the easy to prepare state. They both apply A, which is some unitized on gate, let's say, related to the observable that you want to measure, and then to evolve for some other time, and then look at the overlap with the initial state. And so there is a subtlety here, I'm not going to enter that, is that whenever you want to now take all these quantities that you measure and put them in the formula to do the computation, this has, it, this part, this, these quantities are, are complex numbers. It means that you have to measure the absolute value and the phase. And the absolute value is relatively easy to measure. You just start with some initial state, you put your, I mean, you have product state, for example, start with your product state, then you evolve and then you check if you end up in the same product state. If it's the same product state, then you put a one. And if it's a different one, you put a zero. And then this is the average that you do at the end. However, the phase is much more difficult to get. And you can do it either with the parameter or other markets or there are many tricks. And so in the in the paper, we get some, some ways in which you can do it without having to create strong gas and something like that. And something that we 
that we're working on, I think that in, in itself is an, is an interesting problem. An algorithm to detect the phases of what we get. Well, so that's what I said. So you start with some spins, then you evolve, and then you check if you have the same state, and you need to wait to be the hard algorithm. Now you can go through the computational time of this algorithm, this quantum algorithm, and it turns out that the computational time stays polynomially with n, one over delta, and one over epsilon. And so, therefore, even if n delta goes by one over n, this is polynomial in n, and uh, then this means that you can compute these thermodynamic properties, right, that I mentioned before, more efficiently with this quantum algorithm than with a classical algorithm. And the algorithm, does not require to create anything. So, in principle, with an analog device, you just have to be able to prepare a state and then evolve it and then check if you have a state. So, you can do that and you can run it in analog device. You don't need a, a digital device. Just one little point about the about uh, now the other problem, the canonical ensemble, the final temperature. So, here you're giving now the same problem. You're giving instead of giving some energy, you're giving some temperature. And then what you would like to compute is the expectation value of some observable with some precision epsilon and with the state, which is the Gibbs state corresponding to that temperature. And, uh, and, and so the question is now how things get with n and the temperatures and so on. And so the algorithm, I mean, what you can have here is a heuristic algorithm, meaning that you cannot prove that this is going to work. However, it overcomes what is called the sign problem. In quantum Monte Carlo simulation. So let me talk a little bit about, about that. So in there is a classical algorithm to solve problems at finite temperature. It's called quantum Monte Carlo. It's called quantum, but it's a classical algorithm. And what it does is that it samples configurations. So you start with a product state and then takes a product state and then computes expectation value, compute the observable that they want to measure with this product state. Then it samples and takes another product state. And computes and then it samples and then some other product state and at the end you average the, the result and this gives you the result. However, in order to be able to sample, you have to be able to compute what are the probabilities in the Boltzmann distribution of each of the configurations. So you take one configuration, then you propose another configuration, then you compute what is the probability of that configuration, so the expectation value of e to the minus beta x basically in this, and if it's if it's uh, larger, then you take it. If not, then with certain probability you take it. That's the Metropolis algorithm. And as long as you can compute these probabilities, then it works. However, I mean, computing this probability is a manually problem itself because you have to compute the expectation value of e to the minus beta h. And so, in most of the problems, in many problems, you cannot do that. And so that's why I mean, talk to people working on Monte Carlo. They will tell you. Okay, so there are some problems that you can solve and some problems that you cannot solve. The problems that you can solve are the ones that don't have the same problem, meaning that they can compute this probability and therefore you're able to sample. This doesn't mean that the promise that it will work, because as you probably know, I mean, sometimes when you sample, in order to get uh, the result, you can have to sample an exponential number of times. If you have a spin glass at very low temperature, it still will, will take it. But as long as they're not spin glass behavior, then they work very well and Monte Carlo. Quantum Monte Carlo is a method of choice whenever there is no science problem. So my, my, my claim here is that what you can do is that whenever you have a quantum Monte Carlo with a sign problem, meaning that you cannot compute these probabilities, then you can use the quantum computer to compute these probabilities. You can still use the quantum Monte Carlo methods, like usual, the classical Monte Carlo method, and use as a subroutine a quantum computer that <coughs> will compute the probability that will allow you to sample and therefore overcomes the sign problem. Don't have time to explain it here, but it's based on what I told you before. The method that I told you before, you can think it a little bit in such a way that you can prove that you can efficiently compute these probabilities, and therefore you can make the quantum Monte Carlo standard sign free with a quantum computer used as a, as a subject. Not this, uh, again, I mean, this doesn't mean that you will solve the problem because maybe sampling itself I mean, takes a very long time to converge, but I mean, it's worth as it makes the quantum Monte Carlo method now not to have the sign problem. Okay, so now we also dequantize it. And so what we did is this idea, you can use it now with a classical algorithm. And so we wrote a paper for, for one dimensional systems. So how to define that energy, as I told you before, how to use it in order to improve the classical algorithm that I told you before that scale exponentially. Now you can use these ideas and paper. 
Okay, so with that, I'm finished with the with the first part. Now the second part will be more physical. So I'm going to talk now about atoms and, and problems and so on. It will also be much shorter. But anyway, so now I'm going to consider analog quantum simulators. So again, we're doing the problem, the same problem, we want to solve it. And uh, so we are going to take now our physical system, which could be called atoms, ions, superconductors, or whatever. And we want to engineer interactions in such a way that they, uh, that they uh, uh, resemble the Hamiltonian problem that you have been given. And at the end, so the idea is just to prepare the state. We will do the dynamics or adiabatic evolution in that state by changing the slowly this Hamiltonian or for final temperature, maybe with the algorithm that I told you. No, it's and okay, so. Um, well, so so um, what are the advantages between or the differences between analog and, and digital? So there are advantages and disadvantages. So uh, for example, in a in a in a digital, if you want to do just the time evolution that I told you before, you will have to trotterize your state. You have to take these small time steps. And if you grow the system size, then the number of I mean the trotter steps, so the time that you take will get smaller. So the number of gates will grow by a lot. And so this means that in practice, if you have errors in your quantum computer, then they will accumulate. And that's why it's very difficult in digital quantum computers to do dynamical experiments that corresponds to evolution with some Hamiltonians. Not because then you want to grow the system, then you have smaller steps, and then in the smaller steps, then you will accumulate more errors. Whereas in the analog, there's nothing like that. And so one can one can trace down. So what is this, what, what, what is this happening? Somehow, the reason behind that is that, in, at least in some platforms for quantum computation, when you do a gate, which is an, an angle, let's say, like a two qubit gate, which is a contour not gate, so to the i is in the six sigma six times five halves or something like that, then you, you have some error probability that you have. But now you make a smaller angle, so you would look at an angle which is instead of five halves, like say, a very, very small an angle of uh, pi over 100, then the error is the same. So it doesn't matter whether the angle is small or it's big, that you make the same error. That happens, for example, in some of the, of the superconducting and ion traps on the computer that you were gate, then the error is independent of the angle. And this means that if you're trotterizing, you don't make advantage of the fact that you're not doing anything. You're evolving to in a short time, you're making the same kind of errors. And that's very bad. Whereas in analog com computation, I mean, just uh, evolve for a small time, then the error would be small. And that's why, what is the game? So you have a digital quantum computer in which you could have that the error is proportional to the angle of the gate and you could, and it would be much better for quantum simulation, right? But so that's one, one advantage for quantum simulator in the, in the sense that you don't have to care about. So uh, right. So on the other hand, these analog quantum computers are not universal in practice. So meaning that when you go to the lab, I mean, they, you can do whatever you can do. You can have maybe some robot interaction, they could do something like that, but you cannot have an arbitrary Hamiltonian. In principle, yes. So in principle, I mean, we have shown universality, so you are able to do something with some Hamiltonian, they can do everything, but of course, it relies now on a very complex methods that we have some errors that would be non-practical. So in practice, so you, have a, 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 you will be able to be limited to a set of Hamiltonians that you have, Whereas if you have a digital computation, in principle, you can do every kind of time that, that you want. That's the, the, the advantage. Now, in, in analog, so as far as I know, there is no error correction. So I mean, this means that with time, if we develop digital quantum computers that have error correction, at some point, they will overcome the analog quantum computers in the same way that analog classical computers are not operating anymore because we have digital and they overcame the, the, this, this fact. And well, and, and so for some cases, like if I had fermions, fermionic systems, and I want to simulate the Hamiltonian with fermions, then in an analog quantum computation, if I use fermionic systems themselves, or fermionic atom, then I get a, a big advantage of that <coughs> because it's very difficult. Well, it's, it's not very difficult, but it, it requires overhead to simulate fermionic systems with qubits because they are not fermions, they are bosons. Okay. Anyway, uh, so that's something that I mentioned yesterday about the errors, that the errors um, in quantum simulation. So since we are looking at you know, observables that are intensive, then they're not such a big problem that they're extensive. And that gives you a lot of fuel to quantum simulation, let's say, for many body systems using analog quantum simulators. 
And so now I want to tell a couple of things about analog simulation. And so first is uh, uh, to make a more philosophical point of view. So I've been working in quantum simulation already for many years. And at the beginning, when some people ask, why do we need quantum simulators? They say, well, because you want to solve the Howard model, right? And you don't know the phase diagram of the Howard model. And everybody says, okay, yes, and let's build quantum simulators to, to solve the Howard model. But for me, this is maybe not the, 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 the right motivation. Because I mean, the Howard model has been solved in the meantime, right? By tensor networks or some other method. So it doesn't mean that we don't have any motivation anymore. And so, well, we can solve another problem. But if you have another problem, maybe solve with another method. And so it's more the fact that, that uh, if you have a quantum simulator, then you will have a way of benchmarking our knowledge and the theories that we develop. So let me put it more from the theories point of view. So we would like to now describe many body systems. And we have we'll have a description of all these manipulated systems, and one way of doing that is potential network. There are many other ways, and uh, sometimes uh, we, we don't know if our description is good or not. Okay, you have a tensor network, you have a spec, you solve something, and then you get a number, but there's no way that you can check if this number is right or wrong. And if there was an experiment, even if this experiment is not a power model, but would like to train me and uh, I could train my methods and learn with that, I think it would be extremely useful to develop. Many body theories, and so I think that that's the that's the most I mean the, the, the biggest motivation I mean, for quantum simulation is to allow you to work theory and experiments together to advance the field of, of quantum many body physics rather than to use for solving one specific problem. So that's what I call benchmark. Now, so with uh, I was talking about three kinds of problems: the quantum quantum physics, high energy physics, and quantum chemistry. Let me give you this, this, uh, a couple of transparencies for each of them, and then I concentrate to spend the last five minutes in, in quantum chemistry. So uh, now there have been proposals for all these things, and the level of difficulty goes down. So I mean, condensed matter physics is relatively simple, at least on paper. No, things are very difficult. Going to high, uh, uh, high energy physics gets much more difficult. I will explain why. And going to chemistry, you will see we have even more difficult experiment and things work. Right. So for condensed matter physics, well, you have to collapse of synoptical lattices in a very natural way. If you just write a description uh, of the of the of this atom, then you see that they will, will build some power model. So this means that very naturally the collapse of synoptical lattices can describe or simulate power models, and power models are at the origin of magnetic systems and so on. So that's why with this system can uh, fit very well solving uh, condensed matter physics models. Now, what about high energy physics? Well, high energy physics, it's in principle very different from condensed matter physics. And we are giving some Hamiltonian because, uh, 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 first of all, you have matter and the fields. That means that you have degrees of freedom which are fermionic and degrees of freedom which are bosonic. So, some of them are correspond to the matter. The other one are the fields that mediate the interactions or the forces. And uh, the second is that they are relativistic. And so one would think okay, we'll have to take our atoms and accelerate them to the speed of light, and, and that would make a difference. Then these Hamiltonians are also gauge environment, means that they have some local symmetries. And uh, these local symmetries are very important because in high energy physics, if you don't respect these local symmetries, then it turns out that when you take the limits or you want to go to the thermodynamic limit and so on, then you don't get the right results. You get only the right result if you work in the right subspace, which will feel the symmetries. Therefore, then you will better fulfill the symmetries in the system, which is their constraints. Yeah. And the fourth one is a more formal one is that if you talk to people in high energy physics, so they, they don't talk to you, they don't give you a heavy tonic, they give you a Lagrangian or something like that, right? an action. And so you have to make a translation. But actually, it turns out, well, the are no problems. So, first of all, matter and gauge fields, I mean, what you need is to work both with bosonic and thermionic atoms at the same time. So, some of them will do the same matter, the other one with fields. Relativistic, you don't have to do a relativistic motion because you have an elastic, like an optical elastic. And you have parts of your dispersion relation which is near, and so this corresponds to relativistic. So, as long as your energies are allowed this part, then it will behave really right for relativistic systems. Gauge invariant, then it turns out that you can uh, somehow, when you have collisions of the atom, these are interactions with the atom, they have an observation of angular momentum in the collision, and you can encode the gauge symmetries. In this collision, so that's a doesn't seem to be also a very conceptual problem. And the form from Hamiltonian formulation was done already many, many, many years ago by Colbert and Sass, which you can really use that addition to translate whatever models people have in Hamiltonian formulation. 
And so, well, at the end, you have so all together means that again you have the Hamiltonian that looks very much like a condensed matter physics problem. And so you can uh, 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 simulate condensed matter physics problem that in principle <coughs> you will have you will be able to simulate this high energy physics problem. However, there is a, a subtlety, and the subtlety is that this high energy physics problem you write in terms of the Hamiltonian, then they have four body interactions. Okay, so they have for example in two dimensions, then you meet this would be like the matter field. Matter field, uh, sorry, the, the, the gauge field, the gauge field. So these are bosons, and then they have to have a four body interaction. However, the atoms in, in optical lattices they have two body interactions. So, how do you get from two body interaction a simulation of a Hamiltonian that has four body interactions? And the, the, the way to go to, to perturbation, you know, to first order perturbation theory, and if you do it in the right way, then you get four body interactions as an injective theory. However, this means that you would have to. I mean, work in force of the perturbation field. You have some parameter that is small, and then you have to have this parameter to the force power to be extremely small, so it will be very difficult to work all that. And I think that that's for the moment the bottleneck that people have while simulating uh, in high energy physics classical theories is for that is very difficult in one more than one spatial dimension, in two dimensions because of this four body interaction. There have been ideas to get around, but that's at the moment not the problem. So I'll move to quantum chemistry. And so, in, in quantum chemistry, so just let me tell you two words to what, what is the problem. So, your typical, I mean, one, one possibility is to work. I'm going to specify one specific problem. There are many other problems, but this is just one particular problem in which you are giving a configuration of the nuclei and you have electrons. Now, this will be the molecule, or the molecule, the, the, the nuclei of the molecule, or, or the atoms forming the molecule are at some specific position. Because you are giving that. Then you do a Born Oppenheimer approximation, means that you give them an infinite mass, so these are like set there in the kind of move. And then you would like to know what is the electronic uh, configuration for this position. So you compute now what is the ground state given this position of your Hamiltonian, which is the Coulomb interactions among everything. And then you just have this energy and, and then you mark it. Now you move the positions and then you compute the ground state energy. Then you move the positions, the ground state energy, and at the end you can draw. The energy is a position of the nuclei, and then you have what is called a molecular potential. And once you have this molecular potential, then for example, then you can look at the minimum, and this would be like the geometric structure of your molecule. So this would be where the energy is mean. We will tell you what is the geometry of your nuclear in the system. Okay, that's a typical problem. Once you have that, then you could you put your atoms at this specific position, the, the nuclear at this specific position. Then you solve it again, and then you can put excitations and some other properties, and so on. So, as you see in this problem, if you look at what is the Hamiltonian that you have, then you have a part of the nuclear which is trivial because these are infinite mass and they're at the fixed position, so you don't have to do anything. There is only the, the only dynamical particles are the electrons, the other ones are fixed, so you have to solve for the electrons, and now the electrons now can move, so they have some kinetic energy. Then they have some, some potential energy, so they are attracted by the nuclei. So there is a one where R interaction with the nuclei, which are at these positions. And then the most difficult part is that the electrons also interact among themselves. So they have a Coulomb interaction that repel themselves. So you want to do a quantum simulation, then you will have to do something like that. And so one of the ideas that we, that we wrote the paper some years ago, very sophisticated, is uh, to say, okay, so first of all, since the nuclear at certain positions, then what I have to make sure, well, first of all, is since I want to, uh, to, to simulate electrons moving, what I have to do are Fermi, because electrons are Fermi, it's very important. So let's take fermionic atoms. Now, the fermionic atoms can move in an optical lattice, and since they can move, then they correspond to the kinetic energy. So you would go to, this would be a discretized version of the kinetic energy, so that your system is big enough that it corresponds to the free space. So then, I mean, this, this is the kinetic part. Then you have the interaction with the nuclear. So the nuclear are at its position, so this means that at some positions on your optical lattice, you have to create a potential that is attractive for the atoms. So you can put some laser, and it's a way that they is attractive for the atoms, and then the atoms will be attracted to this potential. And it has to be like one over R. But now there are holographic principles and holographic methods in which you can create potential that really looks and concentrate light in such a way that the atoms feel a one over R potential. So that's relatively simple. The difficult part is now how do you make the atoms, these fermionic atoms, to interact 
among themselves as if they were electrons. These are neutral atoms, so they can interact as long as you interact locally. And you would like them to interact now with a lot that is like one over r. How, do, how can you do that? And so here, the way that we address this problem is simply imitating nature. So the ones who studied here electrodynamics you know that the Coulomb interaction is not just coming from, from heaven. It's coming from electrodynamics. So what you have is that you have theories in which there are electrons that they don't interact with among themselves, but they interact with the electromagnetic field. And the electromagnetic field mediates the interaction, and if you eliminate the electromagnetic field, right? So you do mathematical transformation, eliminate the electromagnetic field, this gives you the Coulomb interaction. But to do with the atoms is something similar. You can say, well, I have now fermionic atoms that they don't interact with each other, but they interact with bosons. So let's put bosons, bosonic atoms there. And now these bosonic atoms at the same time that they're fermions can mediate the interactions between the fermions. And if you write the appropriate parameters, it turns out that you go to a regime where you can eliminate the bosons and then you get an effective interactions between the atoms because like one or another. And so it's, it's very sophisticated and requires many cavities and, and many, many things, but in principle, at least on paper, that's possible. Very futuristic, but it is. So I think that the, the, the fact that it's at least possible is already in an advance. And so let's what this is explained here. And uh, so now well, there are many technical questions. I will not, I will not enter here up to the things. Um, but so what, what we uh, did lately is that we simplify the method from the experimental point of view. So this is I mean, a method that if you can do that in the lab, then you will be able to simulate molecules and you will be able to simulate it very well and so on. But if you don't have this, then maybe there is some Roadmap in which you can start with something that is simple that doesn't provide a full uh, simulation of the whole system and something that resembles that. And that's where we say so, what happens first of all, instead of working in three dimensions, let's work in two dimensions. Okay, because for experiments, I mean, that's it's better we have these two dimensional planes, in case of atoms and optical lattices. So let's do a two dimensional version of quantum chemistry. And it turns out that in two dimensions, you can still have I mean, molecule dissociation and all the physics of the conical intersection, whatever. So the, all the physics of the chemistry is still there. So it will not correspond to nature, but it will give you some, I mean, you will explore the physical phenomena. Of and the second simplification is that so this uh, story about the atoms and mediating by the bosons on it is very nice, but it's very difficult experimentally. So why don't just we take atoms which interact with one over R cube or one over R six potential? Let's take Ripper atoms. And so now this thing that you, that you have is a chemistry, two-dimensional chemistry, instead of a Coulomb interaction with one over R cube interaction or one over R6 interaction. And then and what we did is we played a little bit, and then we saw that you have hydrogen atom, you can have a hydrogen molecule, you can have it, and I mean the things you, uh, you can observe most of the things that occur in chemistry, you can observe with it, you could be able to observe in the system. And then you say, well, that's nice, be nice, but, but this, this quantum simulation of anything. So maybe I'll go back to what I told you about the benchmark. So if you're able to do that in an experiment, then we could try to use my classical method, EFT or tensor network, in order to simulate the system and learn from your system, even though it does not correspond to exact chemistry, something that could help you to develop my method. So I think that that's an extra motivation, apart from the fact that in an experiment you can see, let's say, the molecular orbitals and the, the, the Phenomena that occur in chemistry, then you will be able to do computations that I will not be able to do with my system, and I will learn with that. And so, with that, I will finish. So, quantum I was arguing that quantum simulation is very interesting here, but we have that an analog quantum simulation. It's, uh, it seems to me feasible with the experiments that you guys are doing here in other things in the world, and that we can learn something with them in condensed matter physics. In high energy physics, will be a little bit difficult. In, uh, in, in chemistry, it will be extremely difficult, but if you reduce your, manage your expectation, reduce your expectations, then maybe you can see something that you can learn. <coughs> and still, because what I say here, experimentally, I know that it requires many challenges, so I guess there will be a lot to learn. Uh, so that's the picture of the department. Where I so thank you for your attention. <laughs>
Hey, so for these, I know the first part of the talk when you were talking about all these algorithms that you can do on, on analog simulation, are those all in the complexity class that you talked about yesterday where you can still, you have local errors, uh, that's still scale problem? Thanks, so there. So my talk is that it connects to this one here. So now I could write my Hamiltonians and put these errors. And what I said yesterday would apply to what I talked about today and high unity physics and uh, Condensed matter physics, not quantum chemistry. Quantum chemistry may not be interested only on intensive observables, but in the global energy and some other observables, and there it has to be more careful. So, um, so I'm, I have a question about this uh, comment you said about quantum Monte Carlo. So, I thought that usually the difficult thing is not computing the value of each configuration, but sum over the configuration to have a sign. So I don't quite understand how this uh, concept is ever <coughs> Okay, so now the sign form you can formulate it in many ways. So one way is that you would like to have some probability distribution, some probability distribution, classical configuration. And what you do in practice, there are many methods of Monte Carlo, but one of them is that you compute this expectation value to the minus beta i. It would be a probability distribution. You cannot do that, so you totalize it, and now you put the identity in between. So what you have are elements like n to the minus beta h by m. And if these are positive, then you interpret it as a probability distribution, and then you can sample many configurations. So at the end, it boils down that you have to be able to have something which is positive and can behave like a probability distribution so that you can sample. And you cannot do that when you have the sign law. So what I'm saying is with this method, it allows you to compute directly this n to the minus beta h. It's not exactly that, but something that is related to that. That is positive, you can compute it uh, uh, efficiently with a quantum computer, and therefore you can sample. You don't have sign problem. Okay, so that's that's it's not the, the thing that people do in Monte Carlo specific, but I can do in a way that I can compute that efficiently and sample to that classical configurations. So I was wondering, um, is there some sort of, is there any known correlation between, say, how hard a given quantum problem is to solve classically, and how sensitive the corresponding quantum algorithm is to errors? Yeah, that's, a, that's a good question, and uh, in particular because it would be nice that, from the classical point of view that if you have a problem where with a quantum computer, you will have errors, that the fact that there are errors allows me to have a classical algorithm that works better, provided that I'm allowed to do that error. So there are people who I know, Adam, who was here, has been working on things like that, more from the computational uh, complexity point of view. So you have, now you want to sample some uh, gates like in the Google experiment, and you have errors, then you can somehow use this fact in order to find a classical algorithm that will do that. So I'm not aware of uh, anything like that. So I'm not aware of algorithms that would say, well, I cannot, uh, that do, they do it in a control way. Because in a high control way, you can do the perturbation theory, and then you say, okay, so uh, then it, uh, I mean, it would work well as long as the perturbation theory is small. But typically, we are non perturbative regimes here. And then I don't know a way of doing this. Okay, so thank you. Uh, so in the first half of your talk, you talked about maybe moving from a 